All right, so if I pass, why don't we get started? Um, it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce Dr. Michelle Olson from the Cell Developmental In Integrative Biology Department at uh, UAB Birmingham. Um, I've known Michelle for a while. She is undoubtedly, in my mind, the best person in the world in uh, acid site channel physiology. Um, and she's now branching out and just studying various, how, the role of astrocytes in various neurological disorders. Um, <laughs> I have really terrible at introductions. I, I, I told her this and she knows. Uh, yeah, so Michelle actually did her, both her PhD and postdoc work uh, at the University of at UAB Birmingham and Harold Sondheimer's lab. Uh, she now has her own lab there in a different department. Um, and is doing quite well uh, for herself. Um, so actually with that, uh, her <laughs> day, you know. Uh, title of her talk is Altered Astrocyte Function in a Murine Model of Red Syndrome, where I'm sure she will convince you that astrocytes are key players in Red Syndrome. Thanks. So actually I should go ahead and put this in presentation mode. And I'm gonna turn this on. Um, I'm a loudspeaker, so I don't expect that anyone's going to have any problems hearing me. I'm super excited to be here and talk about um, our work on astrocytes and Rett syndrome. So I started studying this disease about two and a half or almost three years ago, and I'm going to share with you what we've been doing. So before I get started, of course, I'm a new faculty member and I still do a lot of experiments. I still do a lot of electrophysiology. I run Western blots, but clearly the people in the lab are the ones that do most of the work. So Vishnu Karapa um, is an MD PhD student in, or he's leaving the lab and he did most of the electrophysiology that I'm gonna present. Natasha Pacheco is a, is a genetics and genomics uh, graduate student. She helped Vishnu on some of this work, but she's doing a lot of um, RNA sequencing and proteomics study in the lab. Sini Nwobi um, also worked on this project. Um, and then Kelsey Patterson is a new MD PhD student in the lab. And at the end of my talk, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the rat model of Rett syndrome that we're using. And she's the one that's kind of spearheading that project. So clearly everybody here knows what Rett syndrome is. I thought I, you know, I'd put up this obligatory slide of the clinical symptoms of Rett. Um, you have normal, uh, apparently normal development, um, about the first six to 18 months of life. Um, patients undergo language and motor, or the language and motor milestones regress. There's cognitive impairment, seizures, about 80% of the girls have seizures. There's repetitive distinctive hand movements, which is considered a hallmark of the disease, and I put a couple of images from uh, the children with the hand clasping and ringing and hand-to-mouth movements. Uh, there's breathing abnormalities, which I'm gonna get to at the end of the discussion. Uh, severe GI disorders, they have impaired gait and ambulation, and they have small hands and feet. So these are some of the clinical features of the disease. So I think probably everybody in this room is well aware of the fact that until very recently, this disease has been considered exclusively a neuronal disease, and that's for lots of good reason. So MECP2 is highly expressed in neurons. It's been calculated that there's about 16 million copies of MECP2 per neuronal nuclei. Um, the primary morphologic change in humans with Rett syndrome and in animal models is reduced brain size. Uh, neurons show smaller cell somas, simplified dendritic arbors, altered spine density, and changes in morphology. There's changes in spine density and in spine uh, dynamics. Electrophysiologically, there's been a lot of groups who studied um, neuronal electrical properties, both um, uh, 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 individual cells and at a network level, looking at pyramidal neurons and interneurons, and there's a lot of dysfunction. So there's enhanced ex hyperexcitability in certain brain regions, hippocampus and brainstem, for instance. In the cortex, you have reduced cortical activity or hypofunction. Um, there's robust changes in synaptic signaling and deficits in short and long-term plasticity. So this is just a couple of the studies. I thought I'd kind of put this up here as a smattering of what's there in the literature. So, I'll, uh, so I probably wasn't, it was exciting, but probably not totally surprising that when you put MECP2 back in, in neurons, so in this case, they used the tau promoter. So they had a null background. They turned MECP2 on in neurons they were able to rescue some of the phenotypes of this disease. So I just took a couple of figures from this paper here where you have a wild-type animal. 
the mutant animal, and this is a, a, a MECP2 re-expression using tau as the driver. So you can see the, uh, the body size in the rescued animal is restored to normal, brain weight is restored to normal, and locomotor activity is restored to normal. So of course there's been several papers that have had, oops, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this. I was gonna walk right around here. Um, several papers that have had similar results, right, where you can modify some of uh, the disease phenotype depending on the cell type you put MECP2 back into and when you put it, when you put it in. I think probably what was surprising um, was this study by Gail Mandel's lab. So this is kind of where I come in, and this, this idea that astrocytes contribute to the etiology or the pathophysiology of this disease. So this was a paper that was published by Gale's lab in, two, in late 2011, and they turned MECP2 on in astrocytes specifically using a GFAP promoter, and they turned the, this on in animals at about postnatal day 20. Um, some of this was probably to avoid the idea that the GFAP promoter is a little bit dirty, and they may be able to avoid this by turning this on late in development. And basically, and once again, just a few key figures from here, they basically showed that they were, so in all of these images, the black is the wild type, the green is the rescued animal, and the gray is the null. And you can see if you look at the rescue, these animals show a lot more overall locomotor activity. They have, um, uh, if you look at the breathing abnormalities, and these animals were completely restored to normal. So here you have um, a breathing pattern from a RET patient. You see this period of, of uh, irregular activity where the rhythm isn't normal. You see this RET animal that has this irregular rhythm where it stops or pauses, and then you see expiration and inspiration. And when they, when they treat these animals with tamoxifen, um, they're able to rescue that. So that's measured here by the breathing irregularity score and the apneas per hour. One of the other interesting things that they showed in this paper is that they were all also able to increase neuronal complexity when they treated the, uh, uh, when they turned MECP2 back on in astrocytes specifically using tamoxifen. So I think this paper kind of set the stage that astrocytes contribute to this disease, but since then there hasn't been a whole lot of work to look at maybe what are the potential <laughs> mechanisms and how astrocytes might be involved in this disease. So this is kind of where, where my lab comes in. So one of the things that I have studied since I was a graduate student and a postdoc and some of the work that we started in my own lab is this ability for astrocytes to regulate extracellular potassium. So here the idea is a presynaptic neuron fires an action potential, potassium is released from the presynaptic neuron in an effort to repolarize the neuronal membrane. Probably some of the things you, you wouldn't think about all the time is that this is a graded phenomenon, right? So the more action potentials that are fired or the more neurons that are involved, the higher this potassium is going to get, right, in the extracellular space. Elevation of extracellular potassium actually causes depolarization of the neuronal membrane, and if it left out there uncleared or ex for extended periods of time or for any length of time, if it's elevated, um, modulates the efficacy of synaptic transmission, and this has been known for quite some time. So there's this idea that's been around from the 1960s when people first stuck electrode into astrocytes and, and saw how permeable they were to potassium, that somehow these cells play a role in the regulation of, of extracellular potassium. And it's been worked out over the last 20 years or so that one of the primary mechanisms for clearance of potassium from the extracellular space is this idea of potassium buffering. So here the idea is that astrocytes that express lots of potassium channels take up potassium from uh, neuronally released potassium, and because they're at least coupled to one another in a slice, <laughs> are able to distribute this potassium um, from one cell to another and kind of dump it out where the concentration is lower. There's lots of experimental evidence that suggests this exists. If we, so this, one of the things I did as a postdoc was help identify what this channel is, and we know this channel now to be KIR 4.1. It's an inwardly rectifying potassium channel. If we block this channel, we can induce epileptiform activity in a slice, and we also see a rise in extracellular potassium. So um, this is one of the functions that I'm going to, that I'm, that I'm going to be talking about today that, is that we think is disrupted in Rett syndrome. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about KR4.1 and why this channel is unique. So most of the electrophysiology that I'm going to show you is from layer 2, 3 in cortex. Um, so these recordings here are just voltage clamp recordings from astrocytes in layer 2, 3. 
And this is the voltage step protocol I'm applying to this cell. And when I do this, you see this large inward current in these cells. So astrocytes are extraordinarily leaky. Um, when you patch them, one of the things that we do is we crank up the series resistance and whole cell uh, compensation so that we can activate, so that we can see this, this rectification of this current right here. Um, we use barium at 100 micromolar to block this KIR 4.1 channel. So barium is a non-specific potassium channel blocker, but at this concentration is thought to be relatively specific for inwardly rectifying potassium channels. So we have our control uh, cell that we're patched on. We dump on 100 micromolar barium, the current amplitude decreases, and we're able to subtract out this barium sensitive. And what from now on I'm going to refer to as the KIR 4.1 mediated potassium current. So you see this in astrocytes from every brain region, whether you're recording in spinal cord astrocytes from a spinal cord slice, whether you're in cortex or hippocampus, the amplitude of the current varies, but this is very characteristic uh, recording from an astrocyte. So the other electrophysiology experiment that we have over here um, is, is a stimulation experiment. So here what I'm doing is I'm voltage clamping an astrocyte in layer two, three, stimulating in layer four or five and looking at the response in the astrocyte to stimulation. And when you do that, there's only two things that you see. You see a fast glutamate uptake current and you see a slow uh, potassium uptake current. And we can block both of these. So you can see this right here. Here's the trace with barium chloride, which blocks the barium sensitive current, and TBOA, which blocks the glutamate uptake. And here what I've done is subtract out the barium sensitive KIR 4.1 mediated potassium uptake. So we've shown previously actually that the ability for an astrocyte to take up potassium is directly proportional to the amplitude of the current in the astrocyte. So I have an example of that here. These currents look a little bit different. These are from, this is the only data I'm gonna show you from spinal cord astrocytes. Um, and I had these traces, so I just stuck them up here. Um, basically, this is the same protocol that I showed you before. Um, the currents look a little bit different in spinal cord. You can see that right here. So this uh, current, so what I'm doing in these experiments, once again, I'm voltage clamping an astrocyte. And in this case, I'm puffing on extracellular potassium. And you can see this really robust inward current. So that corresponds to the cell that has this larger amplitude current. And if I do the same experiment in a cell that has a smaller, or a smaller amplitude inwardly or barium sensitive current, the amplitude of this is smaller. And we know this is mediated by KR 4.1 because if we put on barium at 100 micromolar, even 50 micromolar, we can completely block this response. So this channel, I would argue, is completely essential for normal CNS development. Um, and this is a channel that's expressed highly in astrocytes, expressed to lower levels, much lower levels in oligodendrocytes and oligodendrocyte precursor cells, but is not expressed in neurons at all. Um, so there's quite a bit of electrophysiological data, data from animals and data from human studies to show that this, this channel affects normal development. So the first data that I'm going to talk about is animal from um, either a global knockout or a glial specific knockout of that channel. And these images are derived from those studies. So this is just a global knockout. And you can see really early in postnatal development, these animals develop severe ataxia and they tumble and they fall and they can't right themselves. Um, this is data from the, condi the glial conditional knockout, which I mean, all of the animals, regardless of w whether it's a global knockout or a glial specific knockout, develop all of these things, right? So this is hind limb paralysis in these animals, and this is just an image of an animal having seizures. Since they don't have a movie, that's an animal having a seizure. <laughs> Um, so these animals are deaf. So KR 4.1 sets up the endocochlear potential in the ear, so these animals don't hear. Um, they are uh, ataxic, they have hind limb paralysis, seizures, and early postnatal death. So all the animals are dead by about postnatal day 21. So, and there, this was another recent study that was um, that just came out last year showing that homozygous mutations in KR4.1 are associated with spinal cerebellar ataxia and myokemia, um, and seizures are both in Jack Russell Terriers. So here, if I can, oops. okay, I have to come around to this side. I'm not that, not that talented. So this is an animal with a point mutation in KR4.1, and these puppies develop ataxia really early. 
um, and it becomes completely debilitating. So the, the animals have to be euthanized. She's having a hard time tumbling around there. Um, so then there's also human studies of this channel. So this channel was dubbed a seizure susceptibility gene um, back in 2004, and it was also termed the same in mice. There are subsets of mutation, uh, patients who have autism that also have seizures that have uh, mutations. These are actually gain-of-function mutations in KR4.1. And then this channel is known to be causative for a disease called Sesame or East syndrome. So these patients present with early onset seizures, so tonic-clonic seizures at about three months of age. Um, they have severe cognitive deficits. They have ataxia and a wide stance. Um, deficits in ambulation, so the patients who can walk have ataxia and wide stance, but there are some patients who can't walk at all. Um, they have a severe lower motor extremity weakness, and they, they also have sensorineural deafness. So it was a combination of uh, the, the data that was published just recently, some of this, and there's been several papers now um, on the Sesame or East syndrome, and the, um, some of the similarities between the symptoms in the patients with, K with mutations in CARE 4.1, and um, working at UAB beside Alan Percy, my office was next to Alan Percy's, and we started doing all these journal club papers on Rett syndrome that led us to speculate that maybe this channel is disrupted in this disease. So that's kind of how this whole thing got started. So um, the animal model that we used to study Rett, at least the model that we have most of our data in that I'm going to talk about, is the Yenish uh, mouse. So we also have the KR4, or the KR4.1, the MECP2 knockout rat. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the end. Um, but most of the studies that I'm going to show you are coming from these mice. So if you're not familiar with the Yenish strain of, of mice, we use both the males and the female animals. Clearly, the males, because they don't have any good copies of MECP2, have a pretty early onset and stereo, you know, typical pattern of disease progression. So we start to notice decreased body size or body weight at about week four. They become, I would say, very symptomatic at about week five, where they have decreased mobility, breathing abnormalities, abnormal gait, and hind limb clasping. The first animals start to die at about week seven, and they're, they're, most of the animals are dead by the 10th postnatal week. And clearly, the females, because they get one good copy, their disease is protracted. So I'll try to, um, on the figures that I have, show whether I'm using the male or female animals. So the first thing we did when we started these studies is we made um, slices, acute cortical slices from symptomatic animals, and we started patching astrocytes. And we started off in layer 2-3. And this is just a representative trace here of a wild-type astrocyte and a MECP2 mutant astrocyte. And it, you know, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that these two traces are very different from one another, right? So when we put barium on and we subtracted out the barium-sensitive current, the barium-sensitive current was, was much smaller in the mutant animals than it is in the wild-type animals, and that's quantified over <coughs> here. So this was done in layer 2-3. Um, before we did layer 2-3, we did all of these experiments in layer 1, and we observed exactly the same thing, um, that the, that the barium-sensitive currents were smaller. And when we plotted all this on IV plots. You can see here's um, an IV plot from wild type and mutant animals. This is the barium sensitive current. There's about a 50% reduction in current amplitude, but there's also about a 50% reduction in the current that's not sensitive to barium. So this seems to be some type of um, other leak current. We have a couple of ideas for what this might be, and it's something that we're actively pursuing, trying to figure out what this current is here as well. So our idea going into these experiments is that if the channel that's involved in regulating extracellular potassium is disrupted in these animals, then potentially extracellular potassium is dysregulated in this region as well. So we, we started um, with some really old school experiments. So the experiments that we did here were um, potassium sensitive microelectrode recording. So these are experiments that people did in the late 80s and the early 1990s. You take an electrode, you use a high impedance amplifier, you fill it with an ionophore that you can use to measure potassium. You stick it in a, in a slice, depending on your region of interest. Of course, we did these in layer two, three in the cortex. We stimulate in layer four, five, and we look at the response to extracellular potassium. 
So these studies here were actually taken from another paper, and these studies were taken from a KIR 4.1 knockout animal. So this is just an example of what we might expect to see if um, potassium, if this channel is dysregulated and potassium is dysregulated in these animals. So what they did in, in this experiment, and what you can see from these traces, is with an increasing amount of stimulation, you get, so basically this, this potassium sensitive microelectrode is just measuring the peak response in potassium and watching it come back down to baseline, right? So potassium is elevated when you stimulate, neurons are firing, and then it comes back down to baseline. Obviously, with an increase in the level of stimulation, potassium reaches higher levels and it, pro it takes it a little bit longer to come back down to baseline. So you can see as you increase the amplitude, this gets successively larger. This time to clear or to regulate extracellular potassium takes longer. And then you see this uh, appearance of what is called an undershoot in extracellular potassium. So the things that we can measure using this technique are the peak, the time it takes to return or down to the, to the, 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 where it, the absolute lowest level of potassium that it reaches, and the time it takes to return to baseline. So we can measure the amplitude of this, the area of this. And when they did this in CARE 4.1 knockout animals, what they found, so this is the, um, these are the mice that I showed you initially that had these seizures and ataxia. So the, these experiments were done in the hippocampus. What you see is um, there's an increase in the undershoot area there's an increase in the, in, the, in the undershoot amplitude, and there's also a, an increase in the time to return to baseline. So this channel is involved in regulating extracellular potassium, and these are the parameters that are disturbed when you knock this channel out. So we did these experiments on our mice. Um, once again, recording in layer two, so our extracellular potassium electrode is, is a really small, almost like a recording electrode. We just stick that in layer two, three. We're stimulating in layer four, five, and we're measuring the response of, of, of extracellular potassium when we stimulate. And you can see this really nice predictive. So here what we did is we used a relatively low stimulation um, frequency, and we did this successively three times in a row. So you see this really nice increase in extracellular potassium and it returns to baseline and over and over again in a wild type animal at this stimulation intensity, if we keep doing this, this is what this trace will continue to look like. In the MECP2 animals, we saw a bunch of really interesting things. So one of the things that we, uh, that we saw right off the bat, which is shown here and here, is that you see these traces are sitting at two different levels. So the reason these traces are sitting at two different levels is baseline potassium is elevated in the MECP2 mutant animals. So this was a completely surprising finding that we did not expect to find, especially in a slice. But it's been reported by other groups that this, the potassium tone basically can be maintained in a slice. This is probably not channel mediated. This probably has something to do with a sodium potassium ATPase or something that's setting up those ionic gradients. So we saw a, a, there was an elevation in the baseline in extracellular potassium. We saw that there was an increase in the peak in extracellular potassium. And in the mutant animals, we saw this appearance of an undershoot by the second stimulation consistently in all of these animals, which was really interesting. And it's consistent with what happens when you knock KR 4.1 out of astrocytes. So, OK, so I'm going the wrong way. So we see electrophysiologically that the channel that's responsible for extracellular potassium or the, the, the regulation of extracellular potassium seems to be disrupted. The amplitude of the inwardly rectifying potassium currents are smaller in the MECP2 mutant animals. So of course, we had to go do some protein biochemistry and look at Western blotting. Um, so these are Western blots from, um, from symptomatic males in cortex. Um, and so CARE 4.1 is about a 40 molecular weight uh, kilodalton protein. And when we run it on a Western blot, we al often pick up the multimer. So the channel is a tetramer. So we would pick up the monomer and all of the multimers, to, you know, as you would add them up. So you can see there's a, a nice decrease in the MECP2 mutant animals. And when we quantify that um, across Western blots, we see there's a very significant decrease in protein. This is just a wide field fluorescence immunohistochemistry staining of cortex in MECP2 animals um, for KR4.1. So the peel surface is here. 
Here's layer two, three um, in both of these slices. And you can see there's a very profound decrease in the immunoreactivity in the mutant animals relative to wild type. So one of the questions we were interested in is everything I've done up until now has been in sick, an like animals that are symptomatic and sick, right? So we wanted to know if this is a protein that changes in development before we start to see symptoms in the animals. The idea being is, is this potentially a protein that's lost in these animals or downregulated um, that might contribute to the disease process in these animals? And maybe some of the reason Gail saw the rescue when she put MECP2 back in astrocytes. So we looked at a couple of different time points at P21 and at P10. Um, I'm going to talk about the P10 next because I'm going to get to it on my next slide. But even so, at P21, before there are still symptoms in these animals, but in terms of observable <coughs> symptoms, there's not much happening. We see this really nice decrease in CARE 4.1 protein expression. At P10, it's still significant, but it's a small change, but it looks a bit more variable. And the reason for that is because CARE 4.1 is strongly developmentally upregulated. So its expression doesn't come on in brain. It just starts to come on around P7, and then it ramps up really quickly between about P7 and P14, depending on the brain region that you're looking at. Um, so some of this variability may have something to do with the fact that this is just really early in development for this channel to actually be, be on. So this is kind of this, this idea that I was showing you. So this idea that this channel is developmentally regulated in all CNS regions. So here are western blots, and these western blots are overexposed, and they're overexposed for a region. Um, this is the CARE 4.1 staining, but we overexpose them to try to pick up staining at these early, or immunoreactivity at these early developmental time points, and you can see there's just not much there. So we looked in cortex, cerebellum, hippocampus, spinal cord, and brainstem, and in all these different brain regions, you can see there's a very nice, robust increase of this channel as development proceeds. But one of the confounding factors here is that the number of astrocytes also increases dramatically during this time point. So then the question is, is this robust increase due to an increase in the number of astrocytes or an increase in protein in each individual astrocyte? And I think I'm actually getting ahead of myself right here. So, okay. So I'll get to that. Okay, so we address that question. And the way we address that is we just fact sorted out astrocytes. So we have an enriched astrocyte population. We looked at these cells at different developmental time points and looked at gene expression at these different developmental time points. And that data um, is down here. So we can enrich astrocytes. They have a lot of GFAP and not a lot of MAP2. And we looked at all of our other markers for other cell types. And basically what you can see when we do qPCR and look at this data is there's a robust increase in enriched astrocytes as these cells develop. So this goes along really nicely with data that's been published for about the last 15 years that shows when you patch onto astrocytes, channel function seems to increase as the cells develop. So the channel function increase correlates really well with a nice increase in protein and the nice increase in mRNA expression that we see. And that mRNA expression is right here. So the point of this, um, of this um, graph right here is that we looked at uh, CARE 4.1, so the gene that codes for CARE 4.1 is KCNJ10, and we can see there's an, uh, a robust increase in KCNJ10 mRNA at these same developmental time points from the western blots that I showed before. And one of the things that we've noticed in all of the studies that we've done, and in other people's studies looking at this channel, is that protein and mRNA tend to correlate very nicely with one another, right? So if protein goes up, mRNA goes up. And one of the things that we um, and other groups have, have demonstrated for, for many years, and people have speculated in the glial field that this would be a great therapeutic target in astrocytes. And the reason for that is because in any pathology that we can imagine, whether it's a, an acute injury, an acute spinal cord or brain injury, or a neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, um, expression of this protein goes down, but it, that's typically associated with reactive gliosis. But there's always this really nice correlation between protein and mRNA. Um, one of the other things that we published in this study um, when we were looking at the developmental regulation of this channel 
is that the expression of the mRNA seemed highly dependent on the methylation status of a couple of different regions of the gene. So we, we found, when we did an in silico analysis of this gene, we found a couple of different CPG islands. Um, um, this one here spans the promoter region, this one's in an intronic segment, and this one um, spans the, the uh, transcriptional start site of the gene. And what we did, we did, we analyzed the methylation status of these regions a couple of different ways. So we did high resolution milk curve analysis, and we also did pyro sequencing. So here, what, we ha what I have on this heat map is different developmental ages from a couple of different brain regions. One is the spinal cord, which has higher levels of expression of CARE 4.1, and the cortex, which has relatively lower levels of expression of CARE 4.1. And we looked at all of the CPG sites in these regions. So there were about 90 of them. And what you can see when you look at this is that over time as the animals develop, the level of methylation decreases over time. And these are pretty significant changes that we saw. So in this paper, we were, we were able to show that we could basically turn this gene on and off by manipulating the methylation status of the gene. So we could treat with DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, demethylate these regions, and turn on gene transcription. So we could, do, we could turn on CARE 4.1 in a cell that didn't even express it just by demethylating it. And if we took out these regions and hypermethylated them in a dish and did like a luciferase assay, we could show that when these regions of the gene were methylated, we can turn off transcription of the gene. So why is that important? So I think that's important for a couple of reasons. Um, we know that MECP2 tends to bind uh, gene, promoter regions of genes that are lowly methylated, and we know that this gene in the promoter region, as most, most genes are that are highly transcribed, is lowly methylated. And we also know that the level of protein correlates very well with the level of mRNA expression. So we next uh, performed quantitative PCR in the, these animals. So we have the males, and we looked at the females, and we looked at both in symptomatic animals and early in, earlier in development. And you can see that there's a decrease in CARE 4.1 mRNA, but it's pretty low, right? This is nothing that we would ever pick up on like a microarray or something. Um, and then here in, in the females in the cortex, we have a larger decrease in CARE 4.1 mRNA. We see this decrease in mRNA at postnatal day 21, which correlates with the Western blot that we saw from this age. Um, but at postnatal day 10, early in development, when gene expression first turns on, we didn't see a difference between um, the, the wild type and the transgenic animals. But the fact that the mRNA went down and protein goes down, and that this, we know this channel is regulated by DNA methylation, led us to the question, is it possible that MECP2 binds this gene in astrocytes? So the next um, experiment that we did is we just did a chip assay. So um, I'm sure many of you have talked to several people here who do chips, so this is not new to anybody here. Um, but the idea is that you just formaldehyde cross-link the protein to the DNA. So um, we did this in cortical homogenates. So we looked in wild type and um, wild type animals, but as a negative control, we also did this in mutant animals, and I'll show you the data for that. Then you fragment the chromatin, and we do this just by sonication to shear the DNA into about 800 to 1,000 base pair fragments. The idea being if MECP2 um, is bound to CARE 4.1 uh, in little regions, it's, we're gonna, this is going to be cross-linked in, the, in these small fragments. We immunoprecipitate with a MECP2 antibody, and we did this with a couple of different MECP2 antibodies. I'm just going to show you data from, from one of those today. And then um, you reverse cross-link and amplify the DNA. So in this case, we designed primers that span the promoter region of the gene. And the data for that is here. So the promoter region that we, we did, each one of these primers here is about 100 or 125 base pairs. And these are the ones that we use to amplify this DNA. So this data here is from wild type of five animals. And we have RNA pole polymerase as a positive control, IgG as our negative control, and then the MECP2 antibody that we used. We saw a significant enrichment of MECP2 um, binding the KR4.1 gene at all four of these sites. So the other experiment that we did is repeated this experiment in the mutant animals just as an additional negative control. And you can, as you would expect, you see a really nice um, um, RNA pole binding. 
Um, and there's no, there's no binding or very little binding with IgG and MECP2. So this data would suggest maybe one of the possible reasons for the loss of this protein in, in mRNA is that it's, it's being directly bound by MECP2 and that MECP2 somehow acts as a positive transcriptional regulator for this gene. Okay, so I guess the next question is, does this have an effect on the rest of the brain? Does this matter? I mean, if CARE 4.1 is lost in astrocytes, does this impact the rest of the brain? So I'm gonna, we have some preliminary data that we've done um, looking at electrophysiology and layer two, three interneurons. Um, and the, the way we, so we also have this for, for pyramidal neurons. I'm not gonna show that data, but we basically, out of, as a first pass, just separated the neuronal recordings based on action potential half width. So here what you can see is, and the idea here being that, so the experiments that we did were current, uh, current injections, the idea being that when you inject current into this neuron, it's gonna fire action potentials, that's gonna raise extracellular potassium, and if, that, if, that, um, if there's a less effective mechanism for clearance around that neuron, that's gonna cause that neuron to fire more action potentials when you do this experiment. So in a wild type animal, we voltage clamp these, or we, 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 we uh, inject current into these astrocytes, or neurons, sorry, and this is layer two, three in the cortex, and you can see uh, this response. And we put on barium to block KR4.1, um, presumably the idea here being that barium application would raise extracellular potassium, you wouldn't have a mechanism for clearance. It's gonna increase neuronal firing properties, and then we can wash that off. So we did these experiments in the mutant animals, and so the, I think this data is probably going to be controversial, um, at least with the data that's published so far in Cortex. Um, but what we saw when we did these experiments is that these neurons fired more action potentials when you injected current into them. Um, they also respond to barium application, and we can relatively wash that off relatively well. But one of the things that we noticed when we went back and analyzed this data is that the number of, so here, that, that data is shown here for both um, the number of action potentials and so this is the pre-barium number of action potentials and this is the post-barium number of action potentials. And one of the things that we, that, that popped out of this data that when we analyzed it is there was a smaller decrease in the MECP2, or smaller increase, I'm sorry, in the MECP2 mutant animals when we um, put barium on them, which is kind of um, goes along or supportive of the rest of our data, which basically if there's fewer barium sensitive potassium channels there to block, that you're going to have a re smaller response to barium application. So we've done a couple more experiments, um, and we're still working on this. This data is kind of preliminary, but it kind of supports this whole idea that disruption of extracellular potassium can potentially contribute to this disease. So, um, of course, you know, the, the cherry on the top of the cake for these experiments would have been to do an experiment where we put KIR 4.1 back in astrocytes, we rescue them, and when we do that, their neuronal physiology and the neurons around the um, astrocytes expressing KR4.1 has been rescued. But I think really what we want to do is put KR4.1 back in a region where we can measure a phenotype, right? The cortex is a big place, and we'd have to go back and repeat all of the data that we d have done already up to this point in virus expressing cells. So we have this tool available. Um, we've had it for about a year and a half. We recently published a paper with um, Bal at at UCLA, um, where we showed that when we put KR4.1 back in astrocytes, because um, there's a deficit in KR4.1 in Huntington's disease, that we can re rescue um, some of the phenotypes and the neuronal, the deficits or changes in neuronal physiology in these animals. So um, in this paper, uh, we showed that the current amplitude in the symptomatic Huntington's disease mice for KR4.1, so this is barium sensitive current, is reduced in Huntington's disease. Um, that when we put KR4.1 back in astrocytes using this AAV um, uh, KR4.1 uh, plasmid, so here we're driving expression using a GFAP promoter, um, you, um, you can <coughs> restore, the barium sensitive currents are restored, and that's shown here, so here's, 
a cell expressing the virus versus a cell that a control cell. And you can see that here from these traces and the mean data. So in these mice, potassium is also elevated when careful point one is reduced. And this, we were able to rescue this by putting back this careful point one AAV um, in these animals. So here we have the wild type animals, um, the, the Huntington's disease animals, and the animals where a careful point one has been put back in astrocytes. And we were able to rescue some of the neuronal dysfunction in these medium spiny neurons and striatum. So, um, this data shows that the resting membrane potential was restored back to normal when we put, so this is in neurons when we put careful point one back in astrocytes. Um, the Rio base came back, to, uh, um, was restored to near control values, and the membrane resistance um, was also significantly impacted. So we would like to use this virus, but one of the things that we um, have spent a lot of time thinking about if we want to put this back in these animals is instead of putting it into different regions of the cortex and doing all this neuronal elect so they, we were able to do behavioral outcome measures and see that some of the behavioral deficits in these animals were rescued when you put careful point one back into the striatum of these animals. Um, but we, what we would like to do potentially is move our studies out of the cortex and into other brain affected regions. So KIR 4.1 is very hetero, heterogeneously distributed across the brain. So all of my experiments that I've shown you up until this point and all of all experiments that anyone has done studying this channel since we've known this channel is important has been in frontal brain regions like cortex and hippocampus. And you can look at this and say, geez, why would you do these experiments in these regions? The expression is so much higher in these other brain structures. So one of the reg regions of the brain that we're really interested in moving to is the brainstem because there are small discrete nuclei that we can inject our virus into and see if it has an impact. So this is just a Western blot from the same tissue, some of the same animals that I showed you before. So we have cortex, cerebellum, hippocampus, spinal cord, and brainstem. This is at one time point. So this is at postnatal day 28. We have two animals for each, uh, for each brain region here. I mean, and this basically mirrors what you see right here. This expression of care 4.1 in these caudal brain structures is so high. And I think if we really want to mess with care 4.1 and mess with a careful point one in these animals, we should move in, into one of these brain regions. So this is quantified here. There's about a tenfold increase in careful point one expression in the brain stem relative to cortex. And in MECP2 mutant mice, <coughs> there's a very profound decrease of careful point one in brain stem. So our idea is maybe we can use this virus and bring it into some of these brain stem structures, specifically in particular brain stem nuclei. And some of this stems from this idea that there's um, severe respiratory dysfunction in these girls. Um, and this is a heat map from a table that we generated um, in collaboration with Alan Percy and Walter, data that they've gathered from patients. So this has been a long-term study that's been funded by the NIH to characterize um, um, uh, the girls and how they develop over time. And one of the things that we know, so we generated this, so the idea here is these are all different mutations that are the eight most common point mutations and a couple of large deletions and other common mutations. And you look at um, these individual components that make up the clinical severity of the disease. And what we were able to see when we published this or when we analyzed this data is that, <coughs> excuse me, there are groups of mutations that are associated with lower clinical severity score and then groups of mutations that are associated with higher clinical severity score in these girls. And one of the things that we noticed when we looked at this is that respiratory dysfunction seems to affect all girls at about the same level regardless of what their mutation is. Kind of leading us more into this idea that the brainstem is, is this respiratory dysfunction and brainstem is an important place, place for us to go. Because um, the idea is, at least until I was talking to Walter this afternoon, <laughs> that this breathing dysfunction in girls uh, might be a large quality of life impactor for the girls and their families. And I guess one of the things that, that is also important is it's possible that the breathing abnormalities in these girls may impact 
future development of the brain and brain structures, synapse number of these types of things. Um, this is just a, 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 there's, with the girls, uh, the girls who have these breathing disorders, their, their breathing is characterized several different ways depending on their breathing phenotype. This kind of just gets in, more into the breathing thing a bit. Um, we know that if you knock um, MECP2 specifically out of astrocytes, that breathing is disrupted. And when you put MECP2 back in astrocytes, breathing is restored. We also know that astrocytes in the brainstem, they don't just express CARE 4.1, but they heteromultimerize with another channel, CARE 5.1, CARE KIR 5.1, which confers a really strong pH sensitivity to this channel. So, um, so it's thought, it's been, uh, there's a couple of papers published that show that this channel together with CARE 5.1 are involved in central chemoreception in brainstem. So chemoreception is the mechanism um, by which uh, CO2 or pH sensors regulate the response or the drive to breathe. So the idea is CO2 is elevated, pH changes, and that pH change modulates the drive to breathe. So we know um, from studies with one of our collaborators that if you knock out CARE 4.1 um, using a, a, a viral strategy, if you knock it out specifically in the brainstem or if you use GFAP to, or the CRE to knock to an inducible knockout, that we have a blunted response to CO2. So this is a potassium channel that's expressed in astrocytes and when we knock it out, we have a blunted response to CO2. And there's also data to suggest that the astrocyte-specific knockout of MECP2 also has a blunted response to CO2. So one of the things that we're interested in doing is moving also our studies from a mouse model to a rat model. And I just wanted to spend a minute talking about this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the rat model. The rat model is a good model for us to study breathing because it's larger. Um, the plasmography experiments, um, because the, you know, the rat is 10 times larger than a mouse, the respiratory parameters are proportional to body size. Um, the contribution of astrocytes to breathing has been well established in rat. Um, some of the things that we're interested in looking at is the onset of this phenotype during early development, which is really hard to do in a mouse because they're so small and their tidal volume is so small. Um, also, the rat model is interesting because, I mean, rats are, are very, they have complex social behaviors. They're very easy to work with. Um, and we think that utilization of another model may increase the success of some preclinical studies to clinical translation. So we also happen to have another rat that has green astrocytes. So we've crossed those two rats. So now we have rats that have green astrocytes that are MECP2 mutant animals. So these are kind of interesting animals to study. There hasn't been anything published with these animals. There's only a couple labs that have had them for any length of time, mine being one of them. And so we just kind of did some basic uh, characterization of these animals. So their brains are smaller, which is um, what we'd expect to see based on the literature with the humans and the, and the mice. So um, here's just a representative image from P28 and P45. So you see the brains in the, in the knockout rats are significantly smaller. We don't have data from female brains yet because we're aging all of our females and we haven't sacked any. We've had a couple that have died, but we haven't sacked any and collected their brains. Um, the body weights um, are, are um, very similar between the wild type and the mutants. So these animals aren't, don't get progressively smaller like in the mice, we don't see that. The only time that happens as actually one of the things about this model and um, the other labs who have this animal model have experienced the same problem is the males develop malocclusion. And it's a huge problem because we can't keep control of their teeth. Initially, we tried trimming their teeth, but it's too much maintenance. So probably about 60% of the males we have to sack because they develop malocclusion. And the animals that don't develop malocclusion and go on to, de you know, to develop the disease, um, their body weights aren't different. And obviously, the animals that develop malocclusion, they have, you know, we start to notice this because we weigh them so regularly. You start to notice that there's a deceleration in the rate of growth in these animals, so we just go ahead and sack them. Um, we've also collected this from fem the weight data from female animals as well. So we have that data out to 12 months, and you can see there's a very significant increase in weight in the females. Um, the the um, 
I don't have any Kaplan-Meier curves for the males, but most of the, the males start to die at around postnatal day 30, and we've only been able to take a few animals out to postnatal day 60 or 70 because they all die very early. Um, and they, their symptoms are profound. We know who the mutants are when we wean them. We can, we can see that when we go into their cages. Their fur is different. They're just a little, they look different. And once you spend any time with them, you can tell who the mutants are right away. So we've done some rotor rod experiments, and you can see even early in development at postnatal day 21, these animals show deficits in rotor rod. Um, clearly, that continues out to these later developmental time points. Um, do I have a few? We have, um, they have open field abnormalities. So actually, this is the, the, the other data is behind it. This is supposed to pop up, and it didn't. We have the male data behind this. The males have very significant changes in open field behavior, both in the, I mean, we've analyzed everything. The only thing I'm showing is the total distance traveled and the, and the average velocity. So this is actually from females. Um, the male, if anyone's interested, I have that data as well behind this image. But even the females start to show a significant difference um, in rotor rod behavior. We, we can detect these. Um, but obviously, it's protracted in the females. The males, we start to see it as soon as we wean them. Um, one of the things we notice dealing with these animals is that they don't walk, you know, the rats are so big, so it's really easy to th see things in the, in, the, in the rats that we don't see in the mice. So, um, for instance, when you look in their cages, they just walk funny. Um, they drag their bellies. They walk really low to the ground. Um, when they crawl over their litter mates in their cages, they have a tendency to drag their back hind paws, which we haven't noticed with the mice. So we uh, thought we should do some gait analysis on these guys. And the way this works is the fluorescent light is just shined up. Um, the animal crosses this, this box here. There's a glass, um, a glass platform that they walk across. And there's a light that shines up from the bottom. And it measures the football fall patterns and pressure and everything of the animal's feet as they walk. Um, and you can see, if you just look at really basic things like sequence regularity and crossing speed, that we start to see differences um, in the males at a relatively early age. We can have things like swing speed, stride length, paw pressure, paw area, stance width. These are all disrupted in these animals. Um, here's a, um, so here's a pattern from one of these animals, a wild type animal walking across the platform and a mutant animal walking across the platform. And you can see this really regular footfall pattern where the hind paw comes up to the front paw um, as, as these animals are walking across this platform. And you can see the mutant is kind of all over the place. So this left paws, or, or the right paws on this animal, didn't put as much pressure on those paws. That's why the imprint looks different. And then there's all these green, these are drag marks from the animal's belly as they're moving across this glass, glass platform. I mean, you can see a normal rat just scurries right across here. Its tail doesn't move. It stays up straight. Um, when we look at the mutant animal, so I think he was a P40 um, when we did this experiment. They waddle almost like an alligator, right? So this animal is not different in weight, but it looks a lot bigger. And that's because its body habitus is, these animals don't move very much, so they're just squishy. And um, they're almost like pancakes, right? And when they walk, they literally look like an alligator walking around. So just some, um, they, they have seizures. So here's females having seizures um, when we put them in an open field. So here's a wild type. A male that's about two months old, he, you stick him in an open field, he walks around, he smells things, he starts to explore. We stick his mutant litter mate in the cage. You can see the hind clasping. He's actually urinating. Um, and they just don't move very much. These animals are really sick. Uh, so we've had some animals have some really interesting, uh, uh, they've had mega esophagus, which our vet said they've never seen in a rodent before, but it's seen so the, this, the, these animals, um, we had some females that seemed like they were in respiratory distress, and we called the vet. And the vet ended up sacrificing the females, and they did a necropsy report on the animals, and they saw that her entire esophagus was packed with food. So the food that she was eating wasn't moving through her gastrointestinal system. Um, we also have a, had an, animals where we perfuse them. When we cut open their midsection to PFA perfuse them, their intestines explode out of their body because they're filled with air. They're not filled with food, so 
these are all really interesting phenotypes. I don't know if any of these have ever been described in the mouse, but you know, potentially gives us another model to, to look at these animals. Okay, so the, the gist of all of that is that we're really interested in moving some of our studies into this rat model and into the brainstem. We're interested in looking at astrocytes in these different models and comparing and contrasting them to see what the similarities and what the differences are. So I think, um, Hopefully I've convinced you that one of the roles of astrocytes is, 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 is the regulation of extracellular potassium. So we and many other groups have shown that. I can't see the slides from back there, I'm sorry. Um, our data indicate that there's a reduction in CARE 4.1 protein and mRNA expression in the MECP2 mutant mice. There's a decrease in the CARE 4.1 mediated currents in cortical astrocytes in MECP2 uh, knockout mice. Potassium regulation seems to be dysregulated in these animals. Obviously, we think that can have a profound impact on the development of these animals' brains, just as it does in human brains and in other animal model systems where we show this, and others have shown this channel is dysregulated. We think that there's a good possibility that um, that loss of CARE 4.1 may contribute to some of the neuronal deficits in RET, and hopefully we'll be able to get at that with our rescue experiments. And um, we have preliminary data to suggest that maybe MECP2 actually binds CARE 4.1, and this may be part of the reason why its expression decreases. So we think that um, this is probably one of the first pieces of data um, that provide a mechanic, mechanistic insight to, that might explain how astrocyte dysfunction can contribute to Rett syndrome. And that's all that I have. I have more extra slides if anybody wants to look at them, but <laughs> this is all that I have for this presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. Is KIR 4.1, are the levels of KIR 4.1 reduced in the brainstem in the MECP2 knockout? Yeah, so that is this. Um, this figure right here, I had it on here somewhere. They're profoundly downregulated, actually. Enough so that um, we recently submitted a grant with our collaborator. Um, so this is CARE 4.1 in brainstem. This is in symptomatic males. Um, this is a wild, these are, uh, uh, you know, I think there's like six and 10 animals here, a wild type and mech 2 mutant. So really profound. But the thing is, this is from a whole homogenate, a brainstem, right? You can see that there's different levels. For instance, if, if, so we don't know if it's just going away in this facial nucleus right here, or if there's specific regions where it's dramatically down, downregulated or just an overall general <coughs> downregulation. The, the region we've decided to focus on is the RTN because we know that careful point one is highly expressed there, but we actually haven't done staining or you know, taking isolated micro punches to compare specific nuclei in the brainstem. And with regards to the rescue, could you not do that in astrocytes that is that are cultured? Yes, we could. Um, yeah, and actually, you know, that figure that I showed you with the astrocyte with the virus itself, um, the electrophysiology data was from cultured astrocytes, where we put it back in and. So one of the things that we did with this virus that we have is we have it tagged with M cherry. So we of course wanted to make sure that's functional with the M cherry sitting on the end of the channel. And sure, that's something we can do. We have actually just started some culture studies. Most of the stuff that we've done has been in 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 vivo, um, or not in vivo and slice work. Um, I guess. We need good outcome measures, right, for doing experiments in, in vitro. So co-culturing astrocytes and neurons together and then looking at, we have to recharacterize the neuronal electrophysiology properties to see if they're altered, right, to see if that has something to do with CARE 4.1 and then, and then if we put it back, does it, does it have an impact? <coughs> but yeah, we started those experiments, not necessarily looking at um, expression of CARE 4.1 and how that impacts, um, um, neuronal firing properties, but we're really interested in how obviously mutant and wild type cells when co-cultured together modify things just as simple as morphology and, you know, potentially electrophysiological properties as well. Just to follow up on that question, so um, but do you think that the interaction, the uh, potassium regulation is very um, localized to where the astrocyte reference 
So, or is it more like you can see your slice with allergy experiment was to stick the uh, the sensor into the slice. And then right. So that, I mean, that, that's a, I mean, that's a really good point. And probably one of the reasons why our first focus for doing these experiments, what was it trying to rescue it in culture? The idea, I mean, that's a little bit harder to control when you have this um, basically infinite reservoir of media sitting on top of cultured cells, right? So one of the problems actually with being able to measure exactly what this potassium channel does and what the deficits are is that what we're really interested in is not what's happening in the cell soma, but what's happening out of those distal processes, which are in wrapping synapses. Unfortunately, we don't have the technology to be able to see what's happening in, in terms of potassium uptake out there on those fine distal processes, right? So the problem with these experiments is the input resistance of astrocytes is so low that it's hard to get a really good idea of what's happening in places that aren't very, very close to your recording electrode. So what we really would need to do there is some type of imaging technology which allows us to see what's happening out there at the synapse. And it's actually been something that's held up this field for quite some time is that trying to figure out exactly what this channel is doing at the important parts, not in the cell soma, we haven't been able to directly measure. We can only speculate. This is what we see at the soma. It can only be where there's more careful point one and more potassium being dumped out there at the synapse. It's probably larger, right? So we kind of feel like we're underestimating what we're seeing. So in your earlier chip department, did you see a reduction of PAW2 as a promoter in this uh, max, uh, max P2 knockout uh, astrocyte? Did we see changes in methylation of the promoter? No, did you, did you see a reduction of PAW2 as a promoter in the chip department? Um, in MECP2 compared to wild type animals. Yeah. So the reason I put that data, so actually it looked to us like we saw an increase in pole bond. So we didn't look at Paul 2 binding MECP2. We looked at Paul 2 on KR 4.1 in the promoter of the KR 4.1 region. And it looks like there's more pole 2 binding in the mutant animals than there is in the wild type. So I put this, so I have no idea what this means. I, I don't know if it's like a weird artifact. So the levels of pole 2 binding are higher, significantly higher. So look at the scale here for the wild type animals and the scale here for the mutant animals. So I don't know what this means. But it looks to us like it, like just as a first pass, I'm like, wow, it looks like you have more pole 2 binding at the promoter region of careful point one in the knockout animals than you do in the wild type. I don't know if it's a weird artifact. I don't know if it's real. I don't have any idea what it means. But you said you have, you have less mRNA, right? We have less mRNA, yes, for sure, in the mutant animals. So I don't know what that means, actually. Yeah. And how do you look at the when you should? MECP2, have you looked at there's any correlations with the regions that you shift down and the methylation status of those regions? For the KR4.1 gene? Yeah. So we haven't done that yet, and it's an interesting question. So there's a possibility that methylation is just disrupted, right? So MECP2 binds all kinds of stuff. This is one of the things that happens to bind. <coughs> but that, that, the, that it's we haven't addressed the question, is it possible that the methylation status is disrupted for some other reason, some other transcription, you know, DNMT or something like that, and that's actually affecting careful point one levels. So we haven't repeated like the pyrosequencing experiments in development to see if methylation is altered in these animals. We haven't done that yet, but it's a really good point. And it's possible that just methylation is contributing to these overall lower levels of expression. I guess the outcome for us is, you know, it's interesting if MECP2 binds directly to KR4.1, but the simple fact of the matter is it doesn't really matter that much <coughs> because the protein and the gene expression go down regardless of whether it's a direct effect of MECP2 or an indirect effect, right? I have a kind of comment on that. Uh, there's a new paper from uh, a couple of days ago that the, the MECP2 in mature neurons start binding to the non methylated uh, cytosines in other regions. Mm -hmm. So have you looked at in astrocytes what happens? We haven't. 
No, it's a good question, but we haven't. Yeah, and I missed her paper that came out a couple of days ago. I'm not on top of that one yet, but I'll look at it. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to yeah. check whether are the number of astrocytes in the knockout animals the same as in the wild? That's wife? an excellent question, and we don't have any idea. So. No one's looked at that. So we, I mean, the thing is to do that, you need a really rigorous approach, right? And um, no other lab has done it. I tried to get people in my lab to do it, but I'm having a hard time getting anybody on board um, to go in and count astrocytes. Um, we've tried to do it in a non-rigorous way, like you know, comparing um, GFAP positive cells to new N positive cells and see if that ratio changes. And we didn't see a significant change, but. I don't think our approach was rigorous enough to actually say whether astrocyte numbers change or not. They may. Um, there's evidence to indicate that astrocyte morphology is affected in Rett syndrome. So um, the, the um, Nurit Ballas, I think you had said that she had, had visited here? Maybe, maybe not. So she studies, um, she trained, I guess, with Gail Mandel, and now she has her own lab, and she's looking at oligodendrocytes in this disease. One of the things that she did, though, is a shoal analysis on astrocytes in the hippocampus. And there seemed to be much less branching and um, um, uh, fine distal processes in the mutant animals than there is in the wild type animals. But I can tell you that not all genes across the board go down in astrocytes. So we, of course, have looked at, we studied, we have looked at many genes. We've done RNA-seq and just isolated astrocyte populations and about half the genes go down and half the genes go up, which wouldn't just generally indicate there's just fewer numbers of astrocytes, right? How did you isolate the astrocytes? Oh, we have this back? really super cool technique. So we've been working on this for about a year and a half. Let's see. I mean, does this give an indication of the number of astrocytes as well as what are so, um, it So um, I don't think it would actually give an indication of the number. I mean, I think, I think that probably would also be another another way that wouldn't be super quantitative. Okay. I, somebody needs to go in there and do stereology and count. Well, um, on that note, could you do in vitro proliferation assay? You said that they're JFP labeled, right? Astrocytes? Pardon? So, the astrocytes, yeah. if I got it wrong, the astrocytes are JFP labeled. Is that true? The astrocytes are GFAP. No. In, in the rat, you said the cells the are rats. green. Oh, yeah, they're green. Yeah. In the rat, we have a... Yeah, so uh -huh. can you do, like, maybe clonal look at proliferation, like single cell? Um, and see if proliferation rates are altered? Um, sure, we could do that. But we uh, have it, it, it would be in vitro. And see if the, the, the rates of division or anything has to... Yeah, sure, that's an approach that we could take. If, but what that doesn't address is, I mean, we may see that division changes, but that over time in a mutant animal, that rate catches up, right? So we, I think to address that question very specifically, we really need to go in there and count astrocytes. Yeah, so your expression analysis was with sorted out astrocytes, right? So the RNA-seq was just in astrocytes? So all the data that I've shown you here has been from like a whole cortical homogenate for Western blot and a whole cortical homogenate for um, qPCR. Um, so at, typically astrocytes just, exp astrocytes most highly express this protein. It's not expressed like in neurons. Um, but we actually have <coughs> separated out astrocytes, looked at expression, and done protein analysis on those astrocytes that are separated. And it goes, and the reason we did that is because this protein is expressed at lower levels in oligodendrocytes and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. So we wanted to show that the changes that we are seeing are occurring in astrocytes, right? So we have that data. So the fact that your chip is in total tissue. Oh, that's an excellent question. There you're seeing. Right, so that's a good question. Um, so, right, so we recognized this when we did this experiment, but we did not do our chip analysis in isolated astrocytes. This is from a whole cortical homogenate. So, of course, MECP2 is probably binding and negatively regulating expression of CARE 4.1 in neurons, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the, our idea here would be, I have to go back and think about this. We thought about this when we when we did these experiments that we might actually be underestimating the 
because I don't want to dig myself into a hole here. I have to think about that before I spew out any information. But yes, this is in a whole cortical homogenate. It's not an isolated astrocyte. But it's probably an experiment that we should repeat in our isolated astrocyte population. I have a quick question. You started uh, by saying that the work from Gail Mandel's lab showed that uh, putting LECB2 back in astrocytes can rescue function uh -huh. in a whole brain LECB2 knockout. But the flip experiment, when Gail Mandel's the same paper, they knock out LECB2 from astrocytes and alone, they see mild the phenotype is much less right. you know, severe. It's a much milder phenotype. Right. Therefore, there is a curious asymmetry about there the is function of astrocytes actually of many different subtypes in, in red syndrome as well. You can rescue by putting a lot of things, but, <coughs> but the full phenotype can't be is, a whole, is, is another issue. And so I'm wondering what that says about CARE 4.1 or about astrocyte specific genes uh, that are potentially targets of any so I think that is a most excellent point. Um, and as you mentioned, it's something that's seen for multiple cell types, not just astrocytes. But from that data in Gail's paper, what they showed is those animals where they knock out MECP2, specifically in astrocytes, retained a breathing irregularity, right? So. This is particularly interesting to me. So they put it back in astrocytes, they completely rescue the breathing phenotype. When you knock MECP2 out of astrocytes specifically, you still have uh, breathing abnormalities, um, which is another one of the reasons why we're interested in moving our studies to the brainstem where there's evidence to indicate that astrocytes play a role in this response to drive to breathe in response to CO2. But I mean, I think it's an excellent point. Um, and not one that I'm, you know, to I that, I, that I actually know how to address. I mean, it's a question that comes up um, every time, um, you know, if you present at a meeting or something like that, someone will come up and talk about one cell type, then someone will come up and talk about another cell type. And then, like at, at Leo Gordon, or Gordon conferences or something like that, people hear this information and they're like, this makes no sense to me. How can you rescue it by putting it back in every cell type? So that's confounding too, right? And I don't know that I, I mean, I certainly don't know the, what the answer to that question is. And, um, and how that, you know, how, how specifically we can say that astrocytes are contributing to the disease. What, we can't, what I can say is that when you knock MECP2 out of astrocytes, those animals have maintained some of the phenotype. They have, I think, reduced body size, they have anxiety, some, maybe it's not anxiety-like behaviors. One of the things that we've kind of honed in on is the subnormal breathing that's still there when you knock MECP2 out of astrocytes, um, which I think is, is, is interesting. Um, you know, there's that. I can't answer that question. <laughs> it's a good question. All right, given the time, uh, if there are any more uh, questions, I should just handle the social. Guy right Well, these cells um, that are really flat, and so that's the one that's over here, and then you have the two cell astrocytes with the processes leading from them. It's a pretty.